Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the SEED series, Applied Anthroposophy. We're here with Enrica Holdridge. So glad she's here with us tonight and we'll introduce her in just a moment. So right now, um, grab your candle. I have my matches here and uh, light your candle. And we'll open the space. And our opening comes from Goethe's fairy tale, The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily. Whether I can help, I know not. An individual helps not, but he who combines himself with many at the proper hour. We will postpone the evil and keep hoping Hold thy circle fast. Thanks, Jordan. So, yeah, welcome, Enrica, to our group tonight. I'm so glad you're here with us, joining from upstate New York. Um, Enrique is the co-founder and senior researcher at the Nature Institute, and I'll put that link in there. It's natureinstitute.org, where they hold different courses and inquiries and research projects throughout the year. Um, she's trained in, as a biologist, mathematician, science teacher, and has worked extensively in these fields and has also taken her work one step further to go deeper into these, these endeavors with a focus on the human being and nature and developing a, a deeper relationship there. Um, so yeah, we brought the Goethe in because, you know, Goethean observation is a big part of that as well. Um, so I will, you can read more about her bio on the website. It's very fascinating um, and all the projects that you're involved in, but I'll step aside and let you uh, speak more for yourself now. And um, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my work and our work here at the Nature Institute. So the Nature Institute was founded in 1998. So it's now 24 years old, but of course has a long history before it then <clears throat> stepped into existence. And the motives and why we found it, I hope it will become clear through what I want to share tonight. And we feel, I need to say that too, not as a, a, a particular institution that does one particular thing. We feel ourselves, we, we do hear what other people in other ways um, and and other places also do. So we feel united with many people who strive and try to bring something about, so a service. This is the overall title of this semester. And when you say service, then you always mean that you are answering to a need. So I hope that tonight it becomes clear what I perceive or we perceive as a need and a very urgent need, I, I would say. Um, and then maybe also try to show some pathways, how we want to go about or what we do as our practice and then also practice in our courses. The Nature Institute, you can say, <clears throat> is a, a research institute and is an institute where we want to practice a transformation of science. So phenomenological science would be one way to say it, or Goethean science <clears throat> is another way to say it, showing in the word Goethean science um, the relationship to the German poet Goethe. He is generally not known so well for his scientific work. We sometimes think if it hadn't been for Rudolf Steiner, 
who was the editor of his scientific, natural scientific work in, yeah, over many, many years. If it hadn't been for him, many people would not even today recognize the approach and the future bearing seeds that Goethe laid. He himself at one point spoke about his work. He's recognized and known as one of the great world poets. Yeah, you can, you can say that. And there is no doubt in among German speaking people that he is the greatest or one of the greatest, let's say, one of the great poets. So language. But he himself at one point said, for the future, more important than my poetic work. So think of Faust. Yeah, Faust is Faust one, Faust two, the tragedy of Faust, generally known worldwide, I would say, world literature. So Goethe said, more important than my work as a artist, as a speech artist, will be for the future, my natural scientific work. And that's interesting. So maybe, maybe some of, of this, um, what we feel is in the line of Goethe and um, our practice in relation to developing further um, will become clear tonight. The sciences, and Ruf Steiner in some places speaks like this, the sciences as they have developed in the last five, six hundred years are a major influence. And in, in some places he speaks about the major influence on our human civilizations. And we all maybe can see that and participate and feel the influence. And when you think of it, science is being made by human beings. Science does not fall from the sky or um, is independent from us. So when we feel the science that we work with, what we look at, how we look at the world through science, what we, we find in our science as our approaches, when we find this is not sufficient, this is not embracing all or embracing it in a way we feel we do justice to the things we are looking at, if this is the case, then it would be us who would have to transform and develop science further, transform and develop. And I think we are in this century, we are in a place where this has become a very urgent question. I want to read to you a memory of a person who is looking back at his um, science education, you can say, and he found something. So this is a quotation from a book, Martin Wagenschein, a German educator, children on the path to physics. And here he quotes this man who at an, as an elderly looks back to his use. I have a remarkably vivid memory from high school when I first took a chemistry class. It was quantitative from the outset. From my childhood on, I have had a passionate, almost magical connection to water, both flowing and standing water. When I learned H2O, the formula H2O, I was for a few weeks deeply saddened, as if my beautiful old water was gone, 
And from now on, I would have to think it's only H2O. Childish, maybe, but I was very sad and deeply estranged. After a time, these feelings left all by themselves and the old magic returned. How this inner healing occurred, I do not know. I do know that in any case, my teachers had nothing to do with it. So what does he say? As a child, he was enchanted by everything water, water droplets, the rain, the creeks, the movement, the still water, the flowing water. We, we, can, we can easily understand when you think of it, how in vacations we love to go to places where water gives us a place to be. And then chemistry class, and then this realization H2O. So if you take H2O in what it means, two volumes of hydrogen, one volume of oxygen, these are now gases, in a tremendous reaction, in an explosion actually, transform into a few droplets of water. And this is not unimportant or uninteresting, but definitely you would say, if I take water and all its experience, uh, appearances in the world and all the experiences I can have with water, not everything is expressed in this formula. So sometimes we speak about reductionism. We, we speak about the points of view that are possible towards the world are larger, don't need to be so narrow. When this person, this man, looking back, sees what this is, where he was deeply saddened, he was estranged, but then when he felt he could relate again to the water in all its appearances, in its reality in the world, he called this an inner healing. So there is an inner healing happening when you went through this schooling, you could say, that his teachers could only offer him. And when he could find his own relationship to the water again, an inner healing. And I think there is an inner healing needed In, in relation, yeah, probably for, for more uh, people. Rachel Carson, whom you will know from her book, The Sense of uh, Wonder, or maybe a more um, prominently Silent Spring. So Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring two years before she died in 1964, she earlier wrote a book the sense of wonder. And um, I, I read a few uh, sentences out of this book. Now, a child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that for most of us, that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed and even lost before we reach adulthood. If I had influence with the good fairy who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder, so indestructible that it would last 
throughout life, would last the whole life as an unfailing antidote. So antidote now against what? Antidote against boredom, disenchantments, sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, and the alienation from the sources of our strengths. When we can develop a sense of wonder towards the things that surround us, the plants, the clouds, the rivers, the water, the warmth, the fire, the rocks, the earth, the animals in all their forms, the living soil, the vegetables, if we can develop as adults, redevelop, or maybe never have lost, that would be Rachel Carson's wish for us, never have lost a sense of wonder, then we would not be alienated from the sources of our strengths. In the lecture cycle, entitled with the world of the senses and the world of the spirit, in the first two lectures, Ruf Steiner speaks about the steps and the development, the inner development of the human being to get to know the things you are studying. So I I hear this now, not only as a natural scientist, yeah, I don't have to be a natural scientist to be interested and turn to the world. Turning to the world and giving attention, you could say, is the one gift that we people can give to the world. This is, you can say, giving attention and enduring attention, so not in passing, I noticed this or that, but coming back to something, taking a close look, taking um, a detailed, concrete look, then maybe also not only looking, but with all your senses and with all your inner engagement, yeah, you, you engage. This is a gift that we human beings can give to the world that you can say is the gift of the human being. And maybe the gift that is so very needed. We, we know from ourselves what it means that we are recognized and seen. And if we were not, we would maybe withdraw or we would turn into aggressive modes. So in, this, in the first two lectures of this lecture cycle, Rudolf Steiner points out very clearly that it is not sufficient with our intellectual capacities to meet the world and to meet the things we want to study and know better or know more or know more, let's say, know in their own right. It is not enough to be precise, to be observant, to form inner mental pictures so that we realize when I remember what I've seen that there were certain parts I didn't pay attention to or that we gave um, that yeah that we missed yeah but that I cannot really form a clear picture of the plan that I was observing it is not enough but in doing in this in, uh, engagement 
yeah when you when you open yourself to the phenomena of the world phenomena the things of the world something can happen which we would call we come to a point where we now feel wonder yeah so i'm not saying the wonder needs to come necessarily from somewhere else but because you gave attention and involvement because you engaged you can develop wonder and you can develop and this Rostana says next step you can develop reverence for what you study so i i would like to um introduce you to my two companions in the back of my wall here behind me so you see this one plant and the other green one so i start with the green one <clears throat> i had on my desk at home lying for what reason i don't remember um, one of these seeds. So instead of putting them where they should be to be um, in place for next season where I plant them again in my vegetable garden, I had it on my desk lying. And at one point, not many days ago, I put it into a flower pot that was standing there too. And then I didn't pay attention, but one, one day, I saw something was growing here. Of course, wasn't quite as big as it is now, right? The leaves were not quite as big. And then when I saw who was coming, my pole bean, with beautiful scarlet flowers it will have in, in early summer, which attracts the hummingbirds. And it started a shoot growing up. So then I introduced a pole and it started growing, forming a new group of leaves and continuing. And you can tell it would like to be higher up. So in so, so now just picture, I have many, many weeks of working together with other people on looking at plants and looking at their growth and looking at their movements and their change. So all, all this in my background, and then the realization, yeah, you can have these thoughts and then you go back to these thoughts like you do in a meditation. Yeah, it is not that there is something you have not penetrated. Yeah, you have understood it, but you go back to it. So I go back to this, what I know about the plant and, and a lot of this, I know also, yes, from studying biology. So yeah, I'm not dismissing this. So the realization that this plant, as all plants, forms its own substance, forms its own substance out of air, water, in the presence of light and warmth and needs a few, few minerals from the soil. And as you know, its own substance, the plants with, their, with who they are form very different substances. Yeah, just think of um, all the fragrances or think of um, all the tastes that you can have. Yeah, think of all the structures that are different or the colors of the flowers. So forming their own substances and forming themselves. Forming themselves in their shape. So my other friend here is bone dry. I have it for many years. And it was a cinea in my garden. So cinea's grow up. 
And then as you um, sh surely know, when you cut a flower and you have the right um, variety, then out of the no um, out of the buds of the leaves, new branching happens. So I I kept cutting and the uh, the uh, plant formed new branches. Yeah, I kept cut and at the end a flower. I kept cutting another branching, and so it branched and branched and branched. And this is a, an annual. So at the end of the season, the plant died down. And what it leaves here is, you could say, it's trace in the world that a living plant left behind when it died down. But all of these structures, all of these stems, and then even um, the old leaves you can see, um, show you there was something living and out of life, these substances and these forms were formed. And the senior forms the senior form and the pole bean will form the pole bean form, of course. So when you come to these places and you go back to these places and you, um, ponder is not the right word, but you can say, um, you you let it live in you again yeah you can feel maybe that the the wonder is not far away now and the reverence for plantness in the world can grow so i'm i'm now not following rudolf steiner's uh, lecture further um he he speaks of two more steps that are needed to come to a true knowing. But I want to continue a little more with, with this plant. Um, so you know that one of the substances the, out of the air is carbon dioxide, that the plants form their substances out of carbon dioxide. So what I have here <clears throat> in my hand, oops, can you see it? Yeah, I bring it closer. So this, these were twigs from a tree outside the Nature Institute um, that were treated in a particular way. So they were fresh and young. We cut them from the tree in the summer and spring. And then we put them into a container like this and heated it with a torch. So the sticks are now in here. And here's an opening. So you heat this. So you heat it, you don't burn it. Yeah, we didn't burn the wood, obviously. Yeah, you wouldn't have these charcoal branches. So we heat it, and then at the other end, first uh, escaping is quite a lot of steam. And the steam, when you start smelling it, it has a certain fragrance, can have beautiful fragrances, and it changes. It's not the same thing all the time. And then when you keep this process long enough, going, then eventually something else escapes, not the steam anymore, but a flammable gas, gas. So a little flame can burn here. And this process can take a long time too. And if you then in the end, get your charcoal sticks, yeah, you, can, you can draw with it, then you can say volatile substances have been driven out by the extensive heat or warmth and left over is this black substance. This black substance, carbon. 
So the, you could say from the substances that the plant formed, one element carbon, um, sorry, so you, you, you can see it now. Um, the form has been preserved. Yeah, you can see the little knots here, has, has been preserved. The form did not disappear. And when you then study carbon further, then you, you learn that carbon is a very special element. We find it in graphite, in the graphite of our pencils with which we write, and we find it in the diamond. Two very different forms of appearances the carbon can have. And then you learn, yes, yeah, so, so now you go to physics books and you learn the special qualities of carbon. One quality of carbon is in graphite, it is extremely soft. In diamond, it's very hard, extremely hard. Another very striking physical property of carbon is it does not become fluid. Yeah, so you can heat it and heat it, the graphite, you can heat it and heat it, and it does not get fluid. So it doesn't lose its form. So you can say when the plant forms its body, yeah, think of this body here, the element of the carbon gives it the ability to sculpt itself. Sculpt is its own body. So I wanted to give you, with my friends here, a taste of what it can be that you do not disregard sciences or natural sciences, but you say, I can, by seeing connections and also um, entering with my full participation into the phenomena, I can come to places where I do not have to feel like the like this disenchantment, the disenchantment that we as adults have, but I can as an adult and then even in, in my ways, find a new relationship to the world where wonder and reverence or can be created. And then not only that, it's also you start a relationship where you care. I would like now to read to you from the soul calendar, two verses. And I read them a little bit in my own translation. So I am a native German speaker and I read them in my language, obviously. And um, as you know from your own language, the poems that have written in English can hardly be translated into other languages. Or when, when then you always feel it could be different. It says a little bit something more or differently than I, you hear in the other language. So I feel the same, of course, with um, verses like those. Um, so I, I at least want to uh, bring across the thought of this verse. It is the verse and number 20 in August, the second half of August. Thus I feel my being. 
which far from world existence in itself would have to extinguish itself. And building only on its own grounds in itself would have to bring death upon itself. I'll read it one more time. Thus I feel my being, which far from world existence in itself would have to extinguish itself and building only on its own grounds in itself would have to bring death upon itself. So my existence, my being, my beingness is deeply connected to the world, to the world on the earth and all its kingdoms and the cosmos. And without this realization, yeah, we would bring death upon ourselves. And when you remember, Rachel Carson said, said, we are losing the sources of our strengths if we lose our relationship to the world. We find healing if we find our a relationship to the world in, in this other man's statement. It is clear, of course, that since we need to eat and need to breathe and need to have fresh water, clear water, clean water, good wa water, since all this is needed, you could say it's clear, this is my relationship to the, the you can say the world around me sustains me, makes my existence possible, the planned world makes my existence possible. The sun, the stars make my existence possible. So this is a place that's, you could say, a, a thought or a verse that is worth to be meditated, meaning coming back, coming back and realizing its truth and what it wants to tell us. And when you think of our civilization that through electricity, through our ways of building houses, we have the possibility to not paying attention much to seasons. We have the ability to forget about that it is winter or summer. We can be indoors, day and night we can work. So for us, at this point in civilization, you could say it would be an activity, a, an intentional turning towards the world when I go outside in the evening and look for the stars, if you have the chance to see them. Or I open the window and pay attention to the wind, the fresh air. Or I drink the water with consciousness, with appreciation and gratitude. So we, we, can, we can practice, practice, you can say, or we can, we can say daily, we can do this turning towards the world and realizing that we are embedded in the world and that the world allows us to be. So you could say, I, I can develop gratitude and reverence and trust. In the book, Children and Nature, which is edited by George Russell, there is a beautiful description of, again, uh, an, an adult looking back to his youth. 
And I'm reading you this, you could say this experience of his. My husband, so his wife is um, writing this essay. My husband is fond of recalling an incident that occurred when he was young, a boy scout in Missouri. He was camping with his troop near the Osage River one summer night inside his sleeping bag, inside his tent. He remembers being awakened deep into the night by his scoutmaster. He and the other boys were told to get up, not to talk, that they were all going somewhere. The scoutmaster then led them through the forest of hardwoods, among the black trees, steady with the stillness of night, up to a rock outcrop high above the river and its valley. It was clear and moonless. There were no trees on the rock bluff and the entire night sky completely filled with stars, was visible above them. The boys lay down on the earth and watched the sky in silence. No one said anything. After a while, the scoutmaster said it was time to go and led the boys back to the camp. Recalling that night, my husband says that when he was previously inside his tent and in his sleeping bag, he felt he was defined, that he knew where he was and who he was. But when suddenly, out beneath the night sky, with its wide history and moment of stars, he realized that he was part of something very much larger than his family, his troop, or this piece of ground in Missouri. He was part of the universe, part of something magnificent and beautiful and grand in its mystery. So he could have this realization because he was there under the stars and nobody spoke. In the beginning of today's session, and you did this before, you heard a quotation from the fairy tale of Goethe. The fairy tale of the green snake and the beautiful lily. In the fairy tale, and you saw it on the bridge when they were crossing the bridge, they are crossing on in this image, crossing the river that separates the sense world from the, sen the world where the green snake lives from the world where the lily lives, the beautiful lily. And it is a ferryman who there was, he was in his hut um, looking. So they are now crossing over from the land of the lily to, no, that's not right. They are crossing over to, from the land of the lily to the land where the green snake lives and the last in the line who walks there are these flame-like figures that you saw in this painting. The flame-like figures or gentlemen are 
have never sat in their life and have never um, lay, ne never lay down. They are will of wisps, and they like to eat gold. So gold in the fairy tale comes with a golden king, and it signifies uh, wisdom. Yeah, you can say the quest for wisdom. The snake also likes gold. So for the, I, um, in the fairy tale, the willows, of the, the willow, the wisps, the flame-like forms who never sit or lie down, jump around, yeah? are very jolly and uh, in a good mood all the time. They shake off what they have eaten, what they licked up in gold. They shake it off in form of coins. These coins the river cannot bear. It would come to a, a very bad situation if a coin fell into the river. So think of coined expressions. Coined, we coin our understanding, uh, definitions, uh, coined ideas um, that can easily also become fixed ideas. Yeah, our our ways of thinking about the world. Then this green snake, which is actually then in the fairy tale the one that allows the bridge being built between the two realms, the sense world and the spirit world, the bridge being built. It is a snake. Yeah, so now think of the snake as the creature that is in, most in, in, in the most intense way in, in, in a feeling contact of the, all the contours of the earth, yeah? When you, have, uh, when you have observed a, a snake, it's wonderful how the movements of its head and the movements of its tail all in, in a beautiful undulating movement. So they don't jump. They can also jump, but normally they don't jump. This snake, in her conversation with these flame-like gentlemen, they need her help, yeah? So they shake off the coins, the snake eats the coins, and in her, the coins transform, and she becomes luminous. She now shines light into the darkness and can then find her way into the temple in the ground and in her own light can see now what before she could only feel and touch. She, could, she can find, for instance, um, the sculptures of the kings, four kings, the king of gold, the king of silver, the king of copper, and the mixed king where all three metals are in very, unordered form, you can say, mixed. So what I want to point to is that we as human beings have the possibility through our own life to transform whatever comes towards us, to transform something into Lumin, luminosity, you could say, light, but then make something apparent that was obscure or dark or unnoticed before. So we all have a feeling of wisdom and knowledge or intelligence or information or knowing much is not the same. So in our ability to turn to the things 
and take them in, give them attention, give them close attention. So not what I think about them or assume they are, but let myself be informed by the things themselves. And that in a growing way. So not because I've learned it, I'm done now, but because I learned something, the things become bigger. And with every new encounter, my relationship to it, it and it, what is it now, yeah? So let's say the relationship to the plant world is deepened, enriched, growing. I have a deeper appreciation. So you can, you can hear a little bit what I want to point out to and what I maybe in a, in a somewhat fast way tried to show you what one can do with something one finds yeah, in physics classes or found in physics classes. So it can, this dry knowledge can be transformed. Yeah, the coins can be transformed can grow and can become then significant for us human beings, for us people. Because now I can relate to the world in, in a deepened way. Um, Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who wrote this fairy tale and also was a scientist who worked on plants, worked on light and color, worked on in geology, worked in many different areas. He spoke about his method and his full trust is in the trust of the senses. So school your senses, trust your senses, look, feel, smell, hear, for instance. And then he says, pay attention to judgment. Pay attention to when it comes to a statement. So enter into all your experiences that you can have and then be careful. Maybe you withhold statements, you withhold judgment. So he writes in this essay, the experiment is mediator of object and subject. At this pass, at the transition from experience to judgment, from knowledge to application lie in wait all our inner enemies. And now he names a few inner enemies. Imaginative powers that list, lift us on their wings into heights while letting us believe we have our feet firmly on the ground. So we could say we are making something up. We have a little bit too much fantasy. We are making something up or um, we are not paying attention to details, yeah? We are, so more. Inner enemies, impatience, haste, self-satisfaction, rigidity, thought forms, preconceived opinions, lassitude, frivolity, this horde and all its followers lie in ambush and suddenly attack, both the active observer and the quiet one. So you can hear on this path of getting to know the world, you can say, of Goethean science, where you want to get to know the world in its own right, the animals in their own beingness, the plants in their own invisibility, you could say. <clears throat> On this path, <clears throat> you undergo also 
<clears throat> excuse me, an inner transformation, or you can say you become aware of your own so-called inner enemies. You can also say your you become aware of you yourself, where you yourself want transformation. Yeah, my impatience or my um, my you can say tendency to be rush in judgment or not paying attention to details, not being so interested in details. Yeah, I'm more interested in the thoughts I can bring about. So <clears throat> you learn what other speakers also, I remember in this series have emphasized, you learn to discern between your intellectual powers and where they are not sufficient, yeah, where they should not be given all range, but where other soul capacities want to be developed. So we are close to, um, to eight. And when um, you have a time to converse, um, uh, after a break with each other in smaller groups, <clears throat> I suggest that you can reflect back to your own encounters with the natural sciences or the natural sciences in your lives, also now in your lives. Yeah, and when you think of it, there is no area of life nowadays that is not, you could say, um, touched by the way natural scientific thinking is like. Think of medicine, agriculture, education, for instance. So it could be a, a a question for your group, where was I touched or where did I transform or recover? Yeah, find places of wonder. Where did the world invite me into wonder? And where did I have experiences like um, I read about under the stars where the big true world made itself known to me. In closing, I would like to read to you the partner verse of the verse I, from the soul calendar that I read before, the partner verse. So the, you can say the, the mirror image verse. It is number 33 in the second half of November. You remember the first verse started, thus I feel my being. This verse starts, thus I feel the world. Thus I feel the world which without my soul's participation could find but frostic empty life. And without the power, the might to reveal itself and recreate itself anew in human souls could find only death. So I want to emphasize, it's not only important for me or for us that I, in gratitude, wonder and reverence, become aware of the world around me, 
the world itself is asking for the human soul to take it in and let it grow and let it flourish in us. So I read this verse one more time. Thus I feel the world, which without my soul's participation could find but frostic empty life, frostic empty life, and without the might to reveal itself and to recreate itself anew in human souls could only find death. This is what I wanted to tell you tonight. I hope some of it became clear. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was so beautiful. I feel you brought so much for us to digest in this way of soul participation and learning through the senses. And um, yeah, I feel really nourished by this initiative to, to go and do that. Um, and we're already doing it all the time too. Um, so thank you. And you were referring, Enrica, to we'll take a brief moment uh, break and you can think about this question i'll put it in the chat um about reflecting on your own uh experiences of wonder and when the world invited you into wonder um and we'll come back and do breakout rooms for those who can stay so um this is a time to just take a break step back from the computer reflect and um we'll come back and we'll go into breakout rooms and thank you so much enrica um, and yeah, we hope to see you next. Uh, I don't know if you can stay, but we are. I, still I will stay. Yeah. And, oh. and listen to, um, maybe the ending, right? Yeah. Then we'll, we'll have a chance to come back a little bit and okay. share as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. So just a brief pause. I'll stop the recording. And, um, yeah, just. If anyone wants to share coming out of that space, um, you know, from your own experience, uh, something that came through or from our evening together. You can unmute too, it's available. Um, in our group, we were talking about how sharing our experiences of wonder made each of us feel more wonder. It's like passing it on, you know, like you could you could relate and feel it within yourself. And so it was a wonder filled uh, breakout room. <laughs> nice. Our group felt that way as well. Um, we got to this uh, idea that, you know, my soul and the world are one and, and really have that feeling that also, you know, as humanity, when we're connecting with other people, we're also part of nature. And so that sense of wonder can also be uh, enlivened or awakened in um, in communication and in contact in communion with others. Well, it was very interesting that we have, of course, the butterfly as part of our our pictorial or art view that dear Angela always brings to us with the, the different parts of the chrysalis. And there were two of us that had butterfly experiences mm -hmm. of awe, wonder, and reverence. It was so fitting to have that be shared tonight and then with what all the work we've been doing together. Well, I was really excited because I, as I mentioned in my group, I thought Henrika was a brother of Craig or, you know, of the Holdridge brothers. And so I was just shocked to find out that it was a woman. 
So hello, Enrica. <laughs> you, you've now been revealed. <laughs> Our group had a, a kind of a theme of sound. <laughs> um, mine was a, a healing that took place when we swam with dolphins of a friend who's, who basically the dolphin sonogrammed her and her frozen left arm was healed um, in the space of 45 minutes and it had been frozen for months. Um, and then one of our members sings to people who are ill in the hospital and it brings a sense of lifting in light and wonder. And, um, and another one listens to birds at the, in the dawn and, and almost, you know, the sound of the sun rising almost. But um, so this idea of, of song and singing and our, our wind being song and how it can heal. Um, another person said the medicine traditions of, of Native Americans with healing person or the land. And um, just an interesting thought that the 10th choir of the hierarchies is us. <laughs> so just the, the amazing thing that humans can do. Oh. Concert with nature. <laughs> thanks, thanks, everyone. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear. And we're at the time. Um, but yeah, it's so wonderful we could stay on and, and share a little more. So thank you for doing so. And so, yep, you can distinguish your candle. And thank you, Enrica, again. And um, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you, Enrica. Thank, thank you, everybody in my group. Thank you. Thank you, Enrica. Much wonder to everyone. <laughs>